Well, hello, everyone, and welcome into another episode of The Winsome Creationist. Glad that you are joining me today. We're going to dive into a topic that I think is very pertinent and very interesting in this day uh, because of how hostile people are, not only to the Christian faith, but also how hostile people are to creationists. We're going to be talking about Genesis and God's purposeful design. Genesis and God's purposeful design. You know, Revelation 4.11 says that it was for the glory and honor of the Lord that we are created, that this world was created. It's for his good pleasure. And we want to honor that. We also want to make sure that we are honoring the information that he gave us in his word, right? We, we, we look at the Bible and we want to make sure that we are interpreting it using the proper hermeneutics, which of course is just a word that means how we study and how we actually um, interpret the Bible, get at the meaning of the authors. It matters whether we take a position on what the authors were trying to communicate, how they were trying to communicate. But what I think is really striking is people take issue with Christians and of course specifically with creationists as well for a lot of things that are maybe not as culturally acceptable today or, or whatever. And Unfortunately, it comes down to the idea of, oh, well, you're just trying to confirm your pet interpretation or your tradition raised you to be young age creationist or, or whatever it may be. And so you want to hold on and cling on to that pet interpretation that you have of the scriptures. And if you've been in and around the origins debate for any period of time, you understand that mindset and you understand exactly um, what is going on there. So a lot of what we're going to talk about today um, could be applied, frankly, whether or not you're a young age creationist, right? This is going to be uh, a, a topic, the design in nature, right? Even, even evolutionary creationists, for example, theistic evolutionists, sometimes they're called, will, you know, they take the position that, that creation has been purposefully designed. Um, again, I think they do so at odds with their own scientific beliefs about how these things happen. Um, but regardless, Right? Even they want to admit that there is a, a sort of design in nature. But Genesis is very, very important. In fact, you guys know the ministry, Answers in Genesis. The reason they are called that is because they have found that, uh, and they're correct, that many of the questions that people raise about life today were answered all the way back in Genesis. And there's abundant evidence in both the world and in God's word that Creation was designed by God to accomplish and achieve specific purposes. And we're going to look at some of those examples here in just a minute. So let's dive in. So first of all, there is a sense of purpose in creation that shows up very, very often. It's hard to miss. It seems as though things are designed to work a certain way. It seems as though life, you know, I think of... Uh, the Jurassic Park quote, right? Life finds a way. Well, obviously, there's a very evolutionary, you know, overt connotations in that. But in a sense, it's true. It, life often does find a way uh, because God designed life to find a way. In fact, I don't necessarily take this view, although I'm open to having discussions about it here on the podcast. But there is an, a view within creationism uh, by Dr. G over at ICR. He came up with this called continuous environmental tracking. Again, at least currently, it's not necessarily my view, but it is interesting. It is interesting what he suggested, which is basically that the purpose, the, the direction that was to be achieved in any given organism was placed there from the beginning, right? God designed it to do exactly what it was going to do from the beginning versus natural selection which natural selection would simply be the working out of a, of a creature um, being fit for its environment and then thriving, surviving and thriving in that environment. Most creationists hold to the idea of natural selection. Again, within that young age time frame, we don't have to appeal to old ages, to long ages in order to get to natural selection. But I do think it's interesting that creationists are looking at other avenues as well and, um, and finding potentially some evidence that, that there is this very directional uh, design in creation. Regardless of whether you take those sorts of specific views, the principle still stands. Life finds a way. Life seems designed. Life is able to achieve certain ends. I think also of Richard Dawkins, of course, no friend of creationists, but nevertheless a hostile witness 
when he talks about biology as looking as though it is designed, okay? It is the appearance of design is sort of the way he puts it. So it's definitely there. There is direction and design in creation. Now, what's really interesting about this is that it flies in the face of exactly what the expectations might be in evolutionary thinking. In evolutionary thinking, there is no grand design. There's no purpose at all. Nothing specific is supposed to happen to achieve certain ends. I remember an interview that I did a while back on a different podcast, uh, the Bible Nerd podcast, with Josh Shoemaker and um, his, uh, his, his mentor. I forget his name right off. But uh, and I think it's Shoemaker. Now I'm, I'm, I'm questioning myself. Um, but and they, they talked about this idea of biological uh, convergence, which basically is what evolutionists talk about when they're trying to explain how different organisms in different places and seemingly unrelated can actually evolve very, very similar features, right? This is kind of a strange thing. It wouldn't be expected on evolution. And as sometimes things go, of course, uh, evolutionists gave it a name and uh, readjusted some of their thinking. And of course, now this is evidence for evolution, uh, right? And they talk about how if you were to, to sort of play the tape back and then uh, let the evolutionary course take its place all over again, that, that things would happen the exact same way. And so this, this convergent evolution is something that actually wouldn't match the expectations of evolutionists very well. However, it would match the expectations of creationists very well because God designed certain things to be certain ways, okay? And even if it is evidence for evolution, which I don't think it is, uh, it's just as much evidence for common design for, hey, this is the kind of circumstance, the kind of scenario an organism needs to be in to survive and thrive. So it is going to have similar features to uh, other ones. And, you know, to me, it's way more evidence for creation of a common designer than it is for evolution. Evolution, would ex you would expect things to happen differently in different places. You would expect organisms that are not related at all to have features that are not related at all. Um, if everything's just random, if everything is just taking its own course of action, you know, if, if, if there is coherent design to the underlying mechanisms that produce biological diversity, then why have any expectations of order? And yet everything that you see in creation seems to give glory to God. It seems to evince design, right? It seems to look purposeful. And are there counterexamples? Well, sure, right? You, you, you do have interesting things like, like parasites, right? Where do parasites fit in God's good creation? Well, I'm sure we're going to cover that on this podcast uh, over time because that's going to be dealing with issues of the fall and how God designed things originally and then things went wrong. So we understand that there's enough genetic preloading, if you will, going on in creation to where um, – species can diversify and the fall, I don't want to say the fall was necessarily planned for, but that is an interesting speculation, right? Within the realms of creationism, did God put what was needed in these organisms from the beginning because he knew what would happen? That's a pretty consistent Christian position in terms of the sovereignty of God. But yet, if we really want to say that uh, this was not how it was intended to be, then I think a lot of people would want to say that God didn't sort of preload that variability into creation. So just different questions on that, different ways people want to cash it out. And I'm hoping to have discussions with different people on the podcast to talk through those, uh, those sort of things. So in general, evolutionary theory, old age theory in general, very directionless, very purposeless, very random versus creationism. And I would say most consistently young age creationism uh, really speaks to the purpose and the fulfillment of, of God's intentions in creation, purposeful design. Now, Genesis specifically also answers many of our questions just about why things are the way they are. And probably one of the best videos I think that shows this is the video, it should be on YouTube, it was recorded uh, with the folks at Is Genesis History by Kurt Wise, and he went ahead and did a video called The Age of Things. And in this video, he talks about how if we're going to be consistent when we're reading Genesis, then if we believe in 
old age or evolutionary theory, you have to rip out, literally rip out, many, many pages of your Bible. Most of the early chapters of Genesis are gone. And he gives very, very specific examples as to why this is the case. I'm not going to go through them all here. That's what that video is for. I'm going to link you right to it in the show notes for this episode, and you can go check it out. But it's one of the best videos that I've seen, really showing how the most consistent creationist position as it relates to the way the universe works, the way the earth is, the way that we observe the world around us in God's design is that young age creationism is the really only consistent way of looking at that data. All right, so let's talk some examples. If we're thinking about Genesis and God's purposeful design in creation, what are some examples that we can look at in nature and point to that would give us that idea? I'm just going to give you four. The reality is there are like loads more, uh, but I'm just going to give you four to think about for today. First of all, and we talked about this a little bit already, but is that life is designed for flourishing. Now, what does Genesis say? Be fruitful and multiply, right? Fill the earth, subdue creation. That is our dominion mandate is what theologians call it in early Genesis. We are to fulfill God's plan by filling the earth, by having babies, by procreating, by taking and studying the natural world, by caring for the natural world. This is something that practically I really try to instill into my kids. You know, everybody around the house has jobs. I have jobs. All of my kids have jobs. My wife, you know, we all have our jobs. And I'm really trying to help my kids to understand more and more that we don't just do this because daddy says so. We don't just do this because there's going to be a consequence if it doesn't get done. You know, we do this because stewarding the earth, part of that is cleaning up trash in our house, cleaning up after the dogs, if they make a mess, which they do, you know, quite a bit, um, taking care of the animals that God has entrusted us with, all, all told, taking care of our house, making sure things look nice, making sure things are done decently in order. You know, this is all a part, in my opinion, of that dominion mandate. And we have been designed, human beings specifically, but life in general as well, have been designed to get that work done. We have been designed to flourish. And this very quickly gets into the biological reality that many want to deny in this age. Many want to say that gender is very fluid, right? You could be a woman. You could be a male. It's, it's all about how you think, okay? Many want to say that it should be all right for a, a male to marry a male and for a female to marry a female. What is the problem with that? Well, the fundamental problem with that, and hear me, the fundamental problem with that is that it denies God's design and purpose for creation, right? It denies that life and humans specifically were designed to flourish, to fill the earth. It goes against God's very order of creation. And this is where I think as, as Christians, we have actually maybe an opportunity to, to make some inroads here. Um, in one sense, the way, the way I want to put this is to blame God, but that's not what I mean. What I mean is God designed the world a certain way. He said, this is how it is. It's not just a matter of preference. It's not just, oh, well, God looked at this and he said that that's right and that's wrong. Well, even if that's the case, even if that's the case, it's still God, right? And ultimately, we have to answer to him. He is our father, not the other way around. So if that's how it was, fine. But I think it's beyond that, right? It's life is made to flourish. I think about the... Uh, um, the airline, I forget if it was Southwest, I forget, it might have been Delta. I forget exactly which airline it was. But, you know, back a few years ago when they were really talking about the marriage debate, uh, which they've been doing it for the past decade or so anyway, but uh, really a few years ago, um, it was big in the news. And uh, one of the airlines ran an ad that talked about, you know, we don't care who you click with, basically. And uh, the ad failed miserably because, you know, you had basically two female seatbelts. And what happens if you try to put those two things together? you're going to die. You're going to die, right? <laughs> I mean, if you get into a crash, it's not going to work. You literally can't click them together. So the ad was terrible. And what is the point? The point is it denies the fundamental reality of creation, that you cannot procreate. That is not a procreative union unless you have a male and a female. Two coming together, a male and a female coming together, leaving their father and mother for one flesh, for one lifetime of marriage, never to be broken save for death or the other provisions that are made. And this is how life should be. 
This is how life will flourish. And so I, I think it's actually a wonderful tool that we can point back to creation and say, look, we don't hate anybody. We don't just have random preferences. We're not, we're not afraid of anybody. We're, we're certainly not phobic. It's just that we truly believe that God designed the world this way. He said to do things that denies his creation order is to deny life. It's to deny life. Life is a big concept in the Bible. The denial of creation order is the denial of life. And when you deny life, then life cannot flourish. You are sinning. When you deny life, you deny God's order for creation. And God says, especially if we look at Romans 1, there is going to be judgment for that mindset and that attitude. And part of that judgment is things in that regard worse and worse and worse. And we see that today. So we can point back to creation. We can point back to Genesis and say, this is how God designed it. This is how God made it. This is the intent for creation. And this is why we take our stand on this. By the way, this is one of those areas too, where it gets pretty dicey, especially when you start accepting evolution specifically in the Bible, because you, 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 you detach yourself in many cases. Most evolutionists who also are Christians will detach themselves from the historical Adam conversation in which case you don't have the creation of male and female from the beginning, like Jesus said in Mark 10, 6, that gets you the, the, the clean creationary evidence of the biological reality that we see of male and female. By the way, this is why many who are Christians and accept evolution are also progressive and uh, deny this reality as well. It's an important issue, and taking Genesis for what it says and for what it means lies at the root of it. So the second one I want to talk to you about is purposeful overdesign in creation. Now, one of the best books that covers this issue is a book called Searching for Adam, Genesis and the Truth About Man's Origin. This is one that we did a series on way back in the beginning of the Bible Nerd podcast. And I'm sure uh, as time goes on, I will be sort of bringing back some of those episodes for you to listen to here so that you can get a sense for it. But there is a whole chapter in that book on purposeful over design. And it is a fantastic chapter that talks about how humans are not only designed to survive, but to thrive. And just one of the, the, the greatest examples that I can think of right here uh, is the ability to create music, right? Our ability to create music is not something that is the bare minimum needed for life. See, in an evolutionary view, you would only expect at any point to have the bare minimum needed to survive in a particular environment. But over and over again, we look at the hands of a human. We look at the joints of a human. Um, we look at the, the mind and the, the logical capacity and the consciousness of a human. And we look at these things and they seem to be completely over-designed. In other words, we have more than what is needed to survive in our environment. I would say we even have more than what we need to thrive in our environment. I like the word flourish. We have what we need to flourish in our environment, to create culture, to create community, to be relationally connected to one another. These are all examples of God's purposeful over-design in creation. We're designed beyond the bare minimum, and that matters a great deal. The third one is the magnitude of the universe, okay? The magnitude of the universe. I was at the Ark Encounter I mentioned uh, recently and the Creation Museum. And one of my favorite things to do at the Creation Museum is the planetarium. Now, look it. I've always loved a good planetarium. I love space. I love the planets. I love rocket ships. You know, I mean, thinking about going to Mars, that is something that frankly excites me a lot uh, because I love space and space exploration. And I love the planetarium show at the Creation Museum called The Created Cosmos, because what it does is it shows the scope and scale of the universe and of, of course, us as human beings living on planet Earth relative to what God has created. I think it's so crazy that folks like Carl Sagan would look at that and they would appeal to that as evidence that there is no creator. Man, I don't, I don't get it. The psalmist didn't think so. Psalm 8, I believe it is. What is man? that thou art mindful of him, that has made him a little lower than the angels. It's incredible um, if you think about our place in creation. And of course, the psalmist had no idea of what we know now. And I'm sure in 100 years from now, we'll have no idea today of what they know then, of the scope and scale and magnitude and beauty of the universe. And that Jesus would die for humans living on, to use the secularist term, the tiny pale blue dot of earth, to, to think that he would die for us, 
is absolutely incredible. And to me, if that's the entire, I'm fine with saying that's the entire purpose of the universe. If the entire purpose of the universe is just to show how silly it would be to try to do life without God, then it's accomplished its purpose. Everything ultimately is for the, for the glory of God. And you do wonder, right? Why all these planets? Why all these stars? Why this beautiful universe around us that we have been given the ability to explore? Well, I talked about it in other contexts as well, but I think that God has plans for that in the future. At least I'd like to think so. But it's amazing to me, this whole creation, if it had no other purpose than for us to behold the glory of God, it definitely accomplished it. The magnitude of the universe is evidence of God's purposeful design. How anyone can look up at the stars, how anyone can look at the universe through the telescopes that modern science has given us and observe what God has done and look at that and say there is no creator and say this all came about by chance and say it's all a result of cosmic evolution, billions of years of things crashing together and expanding. And to me, that just seems crazy. It seems like a fairy tale. Okay. And uh, I think we have plenty of evidence looking out there up to the skies that the heavens do, in fact, declare the glory of God. And then the last one I want to talk about a specific example is of symbiotic ecosystems. Symbiotic ecosystems. This is an example of God's purposeful design because it shows that some organisms literally cannot live without other organisms. And in order for them to thrive on this planet, for them to survive on this planet, they need each other. It's fundamentally relational. Of course, there is macro symbiotic ecosystems like, you know, the food chain that we would think of, right? The fact that we have animals that we can eat, those animals eat other animals, those animals eat other animals, some of them eat plants, etc. Um and of course, all of these things are needed for us to be able to thrive and survive. A very common example of a symbiotic relationship would of course be uh, bees and and pollination and being able to of course help uh plants and flowers continue to grow. There are bacteria and organisms that other animals would not be able to live without. It's, it's, it's part of actually like forming their gut and lining their gut and keeping them, keeping their bodies safe uh, and, and free from certain diseases. It's really amazing how God created creation to work together. And you, you got to wonder, and this seems like a simplistic example, but there's really no great evolutionist answer for this as far as I'm aware. You got to wonder how some of these symbiotic relationships developed over time aside for being created and purposefully placed by God. What came first, the chicken or the egg? You know, um, you, you do run into these problems where, and, and again, a lot, of, a lot of the answers to this stuff from an evolutionary side of things are hand-waving answers. Well, it takes place. It all happens over time. It's populations over time, not individual organisms, et cetera. And while some of that is true, it doesn't seem to make sense in a world without direction, in a world that lacks creation. Okay. So Genesis and God's purposeful design, why care? Why have a podcast about this? Why bring on uh, guests and experts in their different fields like we're going to be doing? I've been having some great conversations, by the way. I've got some super exciting people lined up um, and uh, good things are really, really happening. And of course, we're going to do a lot of solo episodes as well. I'm primarily a solo episode podcaster. Um, and so I'll be doing more interviews in this one, I think, than I've ever done before. Uh, and I like doing interviews, but I'll do a lot of solo episodes as well because I love just getting in front of the camera and talking about God's creation. And hopefully you sense the excitement in my voice and hopefully you're excited about it as well. And hopefully you're excited to share the message of creation with everybody that you come in contact with. It's a great time to be a creationist. And don't let the, the, the doubters discourage you. Don't let the secularists discourage you. Don't let people who uh, take a different view on creation and, and they think you're mean or whatever. Don't let them discourage you. Let's help change the game together, huh? Right? Let's let's open up these doors, open up these discussions, have more conversations with people who both agree and disagree, and let's do it in a winsome way. Okay? Genesis, God's purposeful design. This is why we care. This is why we talk about creation. This is why we take a stand on six-day literal creations because that's the only way ultimately that the biblical data makes sense. And it's the only way, ultimately, that the, that, that the data we find in the world around us makes sense. God bless. I love you guys. I appreciate you guys. So excited for the listenership so far. Can't wait to dive into future episodes coming up next week. God bless. Bye-bye.